Good day, folks. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I stole that line from somewhere. I saw it in a YouTube video somewhere. Um, I hope that everybody can hear me. Uh, I am uh, presenting from home today, so I'm using a different headset and a different mic. Um, so if you can't hear me, please do let me know in the chat, and I will figure out why I might be muted. But welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth, for confirming that you can hear me clearly. That's excellent. Welcome uh, to this uh, WordPress Developer API session. Um, as you're joining, please do let us know in the chat where you're joining us from, and maybe feel free to share a little bit about either what you do with WordPress, or because it is that time of year as we're moving towards the end of the year, uh, maybe what are your plans? Are you taking some end of year leave? Um, are you, if you celebrate Christmas, are you, do you have plans for Christmas? Maybe share a bit of that if you would like, um, while I do my usual introductions. Um, so my name is Jonathan. I live in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I'm a developer educator at Automatic, and I'm sponsored to work with the training team. And the training team are the, are the team within the WordPress project that works on, primarily works on Learn WordPress, uh, learn.wordpress.org. We create all kinds of educational content for WordPress, developers, users, designers, beginners, advanced. Um, and my focus is generally on the developer experience, uh, more specifically the extender community, plugins and themes, but also a little bit of sort of core development if we can get some time in. Um, I'll share my, my plans for the holidays. I am taking two weeks leave. Next week is my last week of work and then I will be taking two weeks leave um, and I will be going there's a there's a place in, in the Western Cape of South Africa called the Garden Route. Uh, it is called the Garden Route because it's lovely and green and florally and lots of prettiness. It's up the coast. Um, and I'll be going up there with my family after Christmas and spending some time at the, at the beach, at the coast, um, ideally unplugged. <laughs> I have to take some books along with me and do lots of reading, uh, maybe a little gaming. So I guess I'm not fully unplugged. Um, but uh, yes, hopefully lots and lots of downtime. Uh, Jim is from Philly, uh, US code for fun while retired. Nice. I look forward to the day that I can code for fun, uh, Jim. <laughs> uh, just uh, uh, allowing a few more folks to come in. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Um, today we are chatting about something called the Interactivity API. It is a brand new API that hasn't even been added to WordPress core yet. It hasn't shipped to WordPress core yet. It's very much uh, in the sort of, uh, it was very much in the experimental uh, phases up until now, um, but it's something that is hopefully coming to WordPress core soon, maybe. Um, that's still to be decided. It's something that the the team who, who work on uh, the Gutenberg plugin have been working on, or a part of that team have been working on. Uh, you may know of a team called Frontity. They were a team of developers that I think were based primarily in Europe. Um, and they were working on a framework uh, around the block editor. Uh, that team was acquired by Automatic recently. And now they tend to focus more on Gutenberg development and improving the developer experience and developer APIs uh, within within the block editor. So that that's the team that's working on this. Uh, we're going to be diving a little bit into it today, what it does, how it works. Um, how it might be similar to things you may have used in the past. Some of it is very similar, familiar to me. Um, so we'll kind of dive into that and I'll share some of how it works and how you can start testing it and ideally providing your feedback. Um, today's session is very much about showing you what's, what's there and how to get it up and running, but then hopefully you're able to go off and play with it and then share your feedback about the experience. And I'll share some places where you can leave feedback um, on, the, on the interactivity API. All right, um, a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, again, just welcome to everybody who's with us here today. Um, please let me know if you can't see my shared screen right now. So I'm sharing my slides. I'm also going to, while I'm doing this, I'm going to share the link to these slides in the chat in case you wanna open it up on your side and have a copy running on your side, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I specifically didn't share these slides via uh, slide shares I did last, as I've done before. Um, because this is uh, a bit more of a uh, playing around session um, and I hadn't really finished finished them yet to upload to WordPress TV, but I will do that before I do that, before I upload, but you can check out those slides that way. Um, as always, we are presenting in focus mode, which means I can see all of your video screens, uh, but you can't see each other. Uh, your videos are all disabled right now. If you would like to enable your video, you're more than welcome to. You don't have to, 
Um, and, and that's just how focus might look. It's just to keep everybody safe and present any instances of Zoom bombing. Um, and then as always, you're welcome to ask questions. You're welcome to post them in the chat or unmute to ask them. Uh, this is going to be a little bit less formal of a session today. So feel free to jam questions as you come through. I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer all of them because I am not the knower of all things when it comes to this API. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to point you in the right direction or at least give you my personal opinion on whatever we're chatting about at the time. All right. Um, if I start speaking too fast or you can't understand what I'm saying, please let me know and I will slow down. If I'm rushing through something on screen and you want me to pause for a second so you can read it, let me know, that's fine. Um, we are recording this session and it will be uploaded to WordPress TV probably sometime next week. Uh, so if you have to leave halfway, that's also fine. Um, or if you wanna catch up on this later and watch it again, it'll be there. Uh, it also goes to our YouTube channel so you can catch it on YouTube as well. The link of you can see in the slide at the bottom. Uh, and then the places where you can find all of our sort of developer-focused educational content is on learn.wordpress.org, um, developer.wordpress.org slash news. That's a different team that manages that, but it's a lot of interesting new developer-focused things that happen there. Um, and then finally, our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash at WordPress and then forward slash videos, and it'll take you to all the videos. Uh, everything on WordPress TV is pushed to YouTube as well, but if you're somebody who prefers to watch videos on YouTube, you can do it over there um, if you like. Okay, so as I mentioned today, we're going to be looking at the interactivity API, we're going to be chatting about what it is um, and kind of showing you how to get started with it. Um, dive into a few examples of how it works. We're not gonna to go too deep. Uh, I'm gonna be sharing lots of links with you for further reading. And then I'm also gonna show you a cool, little, a cool little example of what it can do on my personal blog that I set up yesterday uh, and how you can set it up on your blog if you would like to as well um, for some Christmassy fun or any, any other fun if you like. Um, if you want to code along with me today, if you want to uh, replicate the, the examples that I'm doing today, either today or at a later stage, if you're watching this video later, uh, there are some requirements that you will need. You will need a local WordPress installation. You will need to have Node.js and NPM installed so that you can use uh, the create block uh, a tool to generate, sorry, what am I doing here? To uh, scaffold a new block. I'll share that link to that tutorial in the chat. So if you haven't got those things set up, you can watch that video at a later stage and get them set up. Um, you will need a text editor and you will need a terminal to be able to run commands to scaffold the initial block. So those are the tools that I'm going to be using today. Um, so if you don't have Node.js and NPM installed today, you can't follow along with me today, but hopefully you're able to, if, if you, you know, watching the recording later or after the session, you decide to give it a try, you can go ahead and set those things up. Um, my, my piece of advice for 2024 is if you don't have Node.js and NPM installed on your machine uh, and, and you wanna play with some of these new things, Get it going for 2024, even if you never use it, have it ready to rock and roll. Uh, because a lot of what I'm gonna be doing in the new year is not, not, not all of it, but a lot of it is gonna be relying on having that installed on your machine. So I do recommend getting that installed. Okay. Um, are there any questions or any comments or anything before we, before we get into things? Um, I'm going to just have a little sip of water and then we can get going. The one disadvantage of the headset is I have to move it to drink water. <laughs> I don't have to do that in my office. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So the first thing that I want to share with you is this proposal um, post. This was published on the 30th of March, 2023. So beginning of this year. Um, and it's basically the proposal for the interactivity API. I'm gonna scroll right to the top quickly. Um, it's quite a lengthy post. Um, so if you if you want to read through it, I suggest dedicating some time to sit and read through it. Um, there's a lot of technical discussion in there. Uh, there are also a lot of comments on the post where people are asking questions about certain things and why certain things weren't done in a certain way or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's kind of the initial start of where this all kicked off um, and, and, how, and how far it's gone. So it was proposed in, 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 in March. By March already, they, the developers had developed this interactivity API preview, which you can uh, click on the live site demo from that uh, post. Um, and you can, I'm gonna post that into the chat as well. And you can go and see kind of what it does and how it works. And, and, the, and the, uh, the idea behind this thing being an interactivity API is it, it enables interactivity on your blocks. So it, it, it makes your blocks interactive. In other words, when you click on things, things happen. Um, and, and the idea is to make it easier to make things interactive. Um, 
those those of you who've been around for a while, you will remember the early days of jQuery where we used to do things like jQuery on click or whatever it was. And then we used to make things happen and call Ajax requests and make things interactive. Um, so this is kind of like based on, built on top of the foundation of the block editor. Um, currently, uh, a Gutenberg blocks, block editor blocks are not very interactive. They're very static. Uh, so they have a they have an edit component which renders in the in the editor. They have a, a save component which is what renders on the front end. That is very static. It doesn't do anything interactive. And so the goal of this API is to take blocks and enable that interactivity, enable things that are clickable, changeable, movable, and all that kind of thing. And uh, if you click through this demo, you will see things like the little when you hover over it, the little um, uh, movie um, card, whatever you want, sort of zooms in. You can wish it you know click, you say you like it you can do that kind of thing um you can click on a specific item and then it will kind of um go st straight to that page uh, you can do things like play the trailer and it'll open up the trailer on the page um you can then close that trailer for example you can like this movie here um you can click on morgan and it'll take you through to morgan uh, or whoever your favorite actors are from those movies. So it's just creating, you can click on crime, for example, and it does some interactive things there. You will see on the top right, my wish list items are being tracked. Um, so this is this is happening in some kind of local storage. It's not serving it on the, it's not saving it on the server somewhere. It's probably some kind of local storage, um, which if I, if I come back to this, if I refresh this, you'll see the wish clears. That shows you that it's not being stored locally. Obviously at some point you might want to store that locally, but it's creating all of those kind of interactive um, experiences in this environment. So this is a very simple example of, of what it does and how it works um, and, and what is possible using this interactivity API. The next thing I want to share with you, um, if I move that out of the way, <laughs> um, is the status update. So the status update happened in August. Um, so once you've read the proposal, I recommend reading the status update as well. Um, the status update in August was basically what has happened since March, uh, what is the current status, what is the roadmap, where can I find documentation, which is what we're going to be diving in today uh, a little bit, um, and how you can contribute. So if the interactivity API is something that you want to either get involved in, you want to test, you want to give feedback, uh, you want to, maybe you're, you're a JavaScript developer, maybe you want to contribute, you want to test it and give feedback on any bugs you find. This is a good post. Let me actually, I just realized I didn't share this in the chat. Um, this is a good post to keep bookmarked um, because all of the links, all of the relevant links are here. So there's a current status. Uh, you'll see that it was added to Gutenberg 16.2 as the inter interactivity package. Uh, there's some, some things in the roadmap. Uh, there are now specifically getting started guides, which we're going to be using today, and an API reference. Um, there's a quick start guide, current requirements, where you can ask questions. So there's an interactivity API discussions place in GitHub where you can ask questions about what it does and how it works and all of those things. Um, you can contribute in the discussions or there are specific issues uh, in the Gutenberg repository that are linked and tagged for the interactivity API. So you'll see there's a feature, a label, uh, and there's a package label for, for interactivity. So those issues relate specifically to that. Um, and then sharing your feedback and all those kind of things. So if this is something that interests you, I recommend bookmarking these links and using these links to navigate your way through to be able to talk about the what's, the where's, and, and the how's, and the why for's. All right. Um, so those are the kind of the, the two posts that I wanted to share to start off with. Um, now let's dive into the nitty gritty of, of what we can do with this. Um, and the very first link I'm going to share with you is the sort of official documentation for the interactivity API. Um, it does exist in the GitHub repository. Uh, you can access the documentation there, but it also exists in the WordPress developer resources. Um, so if you didn't know, uh, the block editor documentation is basically synced from the GitHub repository documentation to the developer documentation on WordPress.org. So if I go to the reference guides of the block editor and I go down to package reference and I search for the interactivity package, which will be alphabetically here somewhere. Uh, there it is, WordPress interactivity. Um, there is the documentation and you will see that um, it's very similar uh, to the documentation from here. I think they take the readme 
which is the the readme is the first one so interactivity quick start deep dive uh, and it kind of syncs those up so there's those two places that you can read this documentation um, i tend to hang out in github a little bit more for this because this is still very experimental still very new uh, and that's what i'm going to be using today but you can access it in the developer documentation on the WordPress developer docs as well. I'm going to copy that and paste that into the chat as well so you can read through all of that. Um, and what's nice is they've created a very cool getting started guide, um, which kind of talks you through how you can sort of get an example or a live demo set up on your local WordPress site. Um, what's very, very cool is, and I've mentioned the create block tool before, the create block tool allows you to scaffold a brand new uh, a block for the block editor. And there is a specific template that you can use that exists for and uses the interactivity API. So with one command in your command line, you can scaffold a block that supports interactivity and has an interactive block that you can actually see and play with. Um, and that's what I love about it. It's one line and you're good to go. So that's what we're gonna be working with today. Um, run one line and we'll see some things happening. Okay, as mentioned, uh, there are some requirements for this. The very first requirement they do discuss it uh, here in the requirements of the interactivity API. Um, because this is still being developed in the Gutenberg repository, you are going to need to have the latest version of Gutenberg installed, which is currently Gutenberg 7.2. Uh, I think there's just been a 7.2.1. It was released maybe two or three days ago, uh, but you will need 17, sorry, it's not 7.2, 17.2 or newer. Uh, the original requirement was 16.2, between 16.2 and 17.2, there were some changes made to the interactivity API. So if you try and run it on 16.2 now, those things will break. Um, and this, if you're interested, is the reason that my very first workshop on this topic was canceled because we were in that in-between stage where they were busy merging the changes from 16.2 to 17.2 and all of my demos were breaking and I couldn't figure out why and it was because of this change. So we had to wait for the 17.2 update to happen. Um, but so you will need to, in your, I'm going to open up my local WordPress environment. Um, no, that's not my local WordPress environment, sorry. Uh, so it's learn press. So in your local WordPress environment, in your, in your plugins area, you will need to install and activate the Gutenberg plugin. Um, if installing and activating the Gutenberg plugin is not your cup of tea, then the interactivity API probably won't be your cup of tea either. Uh, but if you do want to play with it for now, you will need to install it so that you can, that you can test it out. Um, I've heard that they're aiming, they would, the developers that are working on this would like to get it merged in the next major release of WordPress 6.5, which will be sometime next year. Um, that will depend on the core developers reviewing the work so far um, and whether or not they agree that it should be, be shipped. Um, so I can't say for sure that that's when it will happen, but that's what they're aiming for. Um, so for now, until then, until that's merged into core, if you want to test it out, you will need to install Gutenberg 17.2 uh, at, at a minimum. With that installed and active, as I mentioned, you will need Node.js and NPM installed on your machine, and then you can use the create block tool to scaffold an interactive plugin. And it's this command um, over here in the getting started guide. It's quite a long command because we're using a template. So we're using this template switch over here, uh, and it's the interactive template that we're using. So I can just copy this command from here uh, I'll pop it into the chat as well if you want to see it on your side. And I can hop on over to my terminal. I'm already inside of my Word, my LearnPress site, so I'm already there. So I'm going to switch over to the WP content directory, and then I'm going to switch to the plugins directory. And I could have done that in one command, but I tend to do it individually like that. Uh, and then I'm just going to paste that command. So it's npx at WordPress slash create block at latest. And that at latest is important if you've used create block before. Um, it'll the way create block works is it caches the current version of create block locally. Uh, so if you use the at latest, it'll get the latest version of create block. And then you give it a name. And in this one, we're just going to call my first interactive block just for fun. Uh, baby's first interactive block, whatever you want to call it. And then you pass it this template option. And you say, we want to use the WordPress create block interactive template. So that's going to scaffold the code using that template, which would be a specific uh, block.json, a specific edit file, a specific uh, render and view and and all those kind of things, which I'll, we'll dive into together. Um, so when I hit enter on that command, it's going to start doing a whole bunch of things. It's going to start trying to download the latest version of create block. Uh, it, you see there, there's a new version already. So I, yes, I want to use that version. Um, and this takes a few moments, uh, depending obviously on your internet speed, because it has to download the files off the net um, and then set up the scaffolded block for you. 
So while we're waiting for that to download, I just wanna take a, a, a pause and just check if anybody has any questions around all of this, uh, anything that they that popped into their head while we were looking through all those pieces of documentation. Um, otherwise, we just, I'll just take a water break. <laughs> That was my last sip of water, so I don't know what I'm going to do for my next water break. <laughs> All right, so it's installing any NPM dependencies. It's installing the interactivity package. Uh, it's installing the scripts package, which takes a few minutes, uh, and then it'll start scaffolding the block. While that's doing that, I'm going to hop back over to my notes here, uh, and I want to share with you this link. So this link is, and yes, this is a, a sort of pro tip, folks. If you're ever presenting a live coding demo that takes a few minutes for something to happen, have a link for folks to look at while they're waiting. <laughs> um, so this is an example, a block development examples repository uh, that uh, Juan Ma, who is a colleague of mine at Automatic, he's also the team lead for the developer relations team at Automatic. Uh, he has created this block development examples repo for examples of block development projects that you can work on. Um, and there's all kinds of fun, interesting things in here. What I love about this is he's got... Um, downloadable zips for each one. So you can just download it and install it in your, in your setup and see how it works. He's also using the playground to set up live demos um, of each one of these. If you don't know what the playground is, it's a, it's a version of WordPress that runs inside the browser. Uh, it, it's developed using something called WASM, which is WebAssembly something or other. I don't know any of the technology of how it works. I just think it's pretty amazing. Um, but he set up live demos for all of these. So if you're ever looking for examples of how things work for block development ideas, uh, this is a great resource, and we're going to use the Interactivity API countdown later on in this workshop. Um, so I just thought that was, I, I discovered this while I was preparing this workshop, and I thought it would be a cool resource to share with all of you. All right, and I was hoping that this would be done by now <laughs> after I'd shared the resource with you. Uh, so we're going to dive, we're going to dive ahead a little bit, and we're going to kind of look at uh, what the code for this might look like. Um, so if we go back to the quick start guide, um, you'll see there's a note here about uh, the interactivity API using modules instead of scripts on the front end. Um, that's only really relevant if you are needing to, to cre uh, create a zip file of the, of the plugin you're generating. Um, so don't worry too much about that. Uh, then it talks about generating the build. So once you've installed everything, you need to generate the build. So you just switch to the directory and run npm start so that it starts the development process. And then you can actually use it in your installation. Um, if it says here, if you have a local WordPress installation already running, you can start using the plugin. If you don't, you can use something like WP Now, whatever the case may be, uh, and then dive into the API reference. Okay, good. Um, my block is done. It only took me five minutes of waffling to get you. Um, so my first block has been scaffolded. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch over to that directory. My first thing to do is actually clear this out. So it's a little bit, uh, let me do this, clear this. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to my first interactive block, uh, and then I'm going to run npm start just to get the development server running. Uh, this is something we're using in block development. It kind of every time we make changes to the files, it rebuilds the the build directory. All right. If I now go back to my WordPress site and I refresh, refresh, refresh <laughs> my plugins page, there we have. I have my first interactive block. I can now activate this. Uh, and I can now see what this is doing. So what I'm going to do is over in my posts over here, I'm going to create a new post um, and I'm just going to call it interactive block. Uh, and then I'm going to add the interactive block. Um, okay, there it is, my first interactive block. Um, and in the editor, it just has some text because we don't need the interactivity um, in the editor right now. Uh, the, the interactivity is primarily happening on the front end. So in the editor view, it just has some text and that's all it's gonna have for the rest of the rest of this demo. Uh, but if I save this draft and now preview this uh, in a new tab, for example, what it renders is a very simple little toggle button um, and clicking on the toggle button reveals the content. It's a very simple demo, but it shows that kind of interactivity. Uh, now I'm sure those of you who have worked using either vanilla JavaScript or um, jQuery or any one of these libraries, there are multiple ways to do this. You know, we hide the div or we style it differently or whatever the case may be. Then when we click on the button, we, we bind to the event listener. When the button gets clicked, 
we hide or show or however the case may be. Very, very simple example of how this works and what this does. And I'm sure there are, you know, we've all got many different ways that we would achieve this solution. But what I would like to show you today is how this works with the Interactivity API. So if I open up my LearnPress site in a Visual Studio Code and I hop on over to the plugin directory and I find that uh, block, the first thing I want to show you is the block.json file. So inside of the block.json file, the important thing to see is the fact that it has the supports property in the block.json, and we basically need to set interactivity to true. So that tells uh, the block editor that this plugin supports interactivity, so that'll load any JavaScript that might be required for the interactivity API for this block. Now, what I like about that is that tells me that if I have non-interactive blocks on any post or page, then those blo blocks won't load the interactivity API. It means that JavaScript is not being loaded on every page load. So that's another, another reason why I like blocks is it allows that modularity of what resources get loaded and what don't. The other slight difference you might see, you may never have seen this before with block development, but you may have, is that there is a render property. Uh, and basically the render property allows you to uh, if you if you don't know what uh, it's called a dynamic block, a dynamic block basically allows you to, instead of having the save function and the save function handling what happens and renders on the front end, you can specify PHP code to render on the front end. The original way you used to do that was there was a hook you used to hook into in your plugin or theme code, and there was a callback, and then you could then put your PHP in the callback. As the block editor evolved, they made it possible to use, for you to specify a specific render.php file, uh, which is, I believe, a little bit easier and better to manage. You just have all that code sitting in one file. And you do that by specifying the render property and pointing it to the render.php file. The PHP file name is largely arbitrary. You can call it whatever you want, as long as you have the render property pointing to that file. Then the edit.js is fairly straightforward. It's just rendering the text in the editor. So we're not going to have a look at that again. Um, the index.js is also very straightforward. It's basically setting up the block type. We're not going to look at that again. Um, the next one I want to show you is the render.php. So in the render.php, uh, Telefence is giving me messages. Just give me a second here while I dismiss that. So in the render.php, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the notes, and there's this unique ID thing. Don't worry too much about that. And there's this module. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, but essentially, what we've got here is fairly standard HTML. Um, so this is a div tag. Uh, it just happens to be over multiple lines, which you can do in HTML. It's still valid. Uh, and you'll see that it's using the block editor uh, wrapper attributes to get the attributes from the block. And then it's specifying these data attributes here. Now, again, if you're like me and you come from the jQuery days, you remember we used to use these data attributes. Sometimes we would pass in an ID or we would pass in a value or something like that. And we would then do something within JavaScript. Um, and so the interactivity API makes use of these attributes. If you didn't know, in HTML elements, you can specify your own custom attributes, just as we've got these here. And then you can use them all over the place in your JavaScript if you want to. So uh, the Interactivity API makes use of these data attributes. You'll see they all have the word data to begin with. Uh, and then it's WP is the second part. And then Interactive is the first, the first uh, sort of key name that you can use. And you'll see that you specify a namespace. So what that means is if I specify a namespace, everything that belongs to that namespace stays with that namespace. Um, so you can't call a namespace from somewhere else. It kind of makes the code a little bit more modular, a little bit more enclosed. Um, then you'll see there's this context attribute. And it's it's basically, you'll, you'll see that this code is essentially just JSON. So if you're used to JSON objects, it's property and value, property, value, property, value. It's kind of like an array that way. So the is open property is set to false. Um, and then there is something called a watch. Uh, and the watch is going to use the log is open callback. And I'll show you how that's working in the code in a second. Then there is this on click attribute. Now, all of these WP attributes are specific to the interactivity API. So when we look through the docs just now, we'll see them all. So you have to specify them as data WP interactive, data WP context, data WP watch for it to perform the specific functionality. Um, so you can have things like ARIA expanded. And then you'll see it says context is open. So currently, context is open is false. Um, and so when you click on the button, you want something to happen. So just bear with me on that one. Um, OK, Mateus says he can't see the shared screen. So Mateus, I'm going to pause there for a second, because sometimes that's a Zoom thing. I'm going to pause there and reshare my screen. And hopefully, that'll fix the problem. 
Uh, so let me just stop the share and then let me reshare. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Mateus. Uh, and let's share again. And then Mateus, let me know if you can see my screen now. Um, if you can't, then I'm afraid the problem happens to be on your side, not my. Okay, good. It's working. Excellent. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, so then we have this toggle. You see, there's the button with the toggle text, uh, and it's got this click uh, attribute. And, and, and if you if you start thinking about like a click attribute, and it's saying the action is to fire off toggle. So toggle. Think about toggle being somewhere that happens, something that happens. Um, and when it's expanded, the context is open. Uh, and then for the paragraph, the paragraph has an ID that's just a standard HTML attribute. And its WP bind hidden attribute is not context is open. So in other words, if you start thinking about it, if context is open becomes true, then the data byte hidden probably will change and something will change. So you start seeing how this all works together. So just by using the attributes in that way, we can almost start thinking about like how the code for this might look. The way the code works is in the block.json file, there's another property that you can specify that I didn't mention earlier specifically. Um, oh wait, no, it's not here. I'm talking absolute nonsense. Um, it, I think it's supposed to be here. So no, it's not supposed to be here because it is working. Uh, oh yes, I'll get back to that in a second. So bear with me. Um, but there is this view.js file. Now, originally, if you wanted the view.js file to render, you would specify it as the view property in the block.json and then pass it the path to the view.js file. Currently in the interactivity API, we're not doing that. And I'll dive into why in a second, but just bear with me. But for now, let's have a look at the code. So in the code, in the view.js code, you'll see it is not a lot of JavaScript code that's happening. So the first thing that it's doing is importing store and get context from the interactivity API. So these are um, callbacks, functions, objects, whatever that exist in the interactivity API. And we're importing them into our codes because we want to use them. And then you'll see we set up this new store object uh, or alias or function, whatever you want to call it. And we pass it the namespace. So you'll see that's the name, same namespace there as the namespace we specified in the first container div, the one that is WP Data Interactive. And let's switch these two around. Um, and then you'll see there is actions that you can specify. So that ties into the actions that we're calling here. And inside of those actions, we specify the toggle action. So we set it up to say, right, when the click of the button happens, so this is how we set up the click event handler. We don't have to write button on click event handler. We use data WP on click, and that sets all that up for us. And that's one of the reasons I love this, because just by using that attribute, it does a whole bunch of things for us. So when the click happens, trigger the actions.toggle action. And that is the function that is defined here. Then inside of that function, then we can do what we need to do. Okay, so inside of there, we're saying, right, get the context from our interactive block. And the context we specified over here in WP data and context, and we set that up as a JSON object. And the first property was in, is open and the value was false. And then we said, uh, when we click, change context is open to whatever context is open wasn't. So it's either true or false. Uh, and if you've used uh, JavaScript and true or false, we know that you know, JavaScript folks like to switch it on and off like that. So not is open. So essentially in about three lines of code, uh, maybe more, let's, let's, call it, let's call it four to five lines of code um, and a couple of attributes on the front end, we have bound to the onclick event. We have passed the context from the container to that onclick event handler. And then we run the code, just the code we need inside of there. And that's what makes all these things toggling it on and off happen. Um, so what I like about this is, A, it's a lot less code for me to write. Um, and B, the, the attributes they're using are very sort of, there's a, there's a special word they use in the post. I can't remember what it is now. I think it's declarative, I think is the right word, where the attribute makes sense. The attribute ties into the action it does. So data WP on click ties into the on click event registers a handler for you. And all it needs you to do is tell it, right, where is the action that I'm firing? Um, and then you specify the action in your store tied to your namespace, and then you put your code in your action. Okay, the log is open is, is essentially just another callback. Um, where did we set that up originally? Sorry, I hear my cat moaning, so I hope he's not stuck anyway. <laughs> um, uh, here we go. It's So the, the log is open callback is happening on the div. 
So the div is watching all the time and anytime something changes, it's gonna run that log is open callback and it simply logs the value of is open as true or false to the console. So you can set up watches to watch different things and do different things and report on different things. Um, sorry, just give me one sec. Happy to report that the moaning cat is outside the bedroom, so not my problem. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so the log is open callback is just running all the time. When things change, it reports whatever you need to do. So you can set up those kind of watches on things. And again, it's a very simple little bit of code. You say, I want to register a watcher and I want it to, and what I like about this as well is the, the fact that I've set up callbacks and actions is kind of sort of custom, it's how I want it to be. Um, I could probably call action something else. I could call callback something else. I can have multiple sets of functionality within my store for my namespace and then do whatever I want. So it gives me that flexibility to write, kind of write the code the way I wanted to um, and then use the things that I, that I need to do. <laughs> Adrian says, I'm glad I'm not the only one who gets harassed and bossed around by a cat. Uh, it's just because I'm at home today. So I'm at home with the, the two cats and the two dogs. All right, um, so that is a brief overview of the first plugin that you can create and kind of what it does and what it can do. Um, I wanted to just stop and check if there are any questions on all of that. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, it's a lot of information to dump on you, so I understand if you might not have questions. I do recommend checking this out, playing with it, uh, diving through the documentation, seeing how all this works um, and taking it from there. But I just wanted to check if there are any questions before we, before we carry on with the rest of what I wanted to show you. All right, we don't seem to have any questions at this point in time, which is perfectly fine. Um, what I would like to dive into, just sort of dive in very briefly with you is the API reference documentation. Um, so in the reference documentation, there's this wonderful instruction, talks about how things work. Uh, it, it, there's a nice visual overview of how this all fits together. If you're somebody who, who understands things better visually, um, I'm the kind of person who understands things better when I fiddle with the code. So this visual doesn't help me at all. Um, but there is that. And then there is the table of contents with all the directives. So you'll see that it has the list of directives uh, and then some in information about the store. So the directives are basically the custom attributes as we discussed. Um, each directive has a specific thing that it can do. Uh, and the very first interactive, uh, sorry, the very first directive they talk about is the WP interactive directive. Um, so this basically activates the interactivity for the DOM element and all of its children. So when you are developing uh, I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller because I find it a bit difficult to uh, just zoom out a little bit here. Can I remember how to zoom out? <laughs> here, appearance, here we go. Just zoom out once. There we go. Um, so you'll notice that the container div element has the WP interactive directive. So that needs to be set up for every container that is going to require interactivity to happen. Um, you'll notice it's usually the same container element that is the sort of parent element for your block. Uh, if, you, if you know from block development, all blocks have one parent element. So if you need to have multiple elements inside, that's usually a div. Um, and so that's the one you would usually specify as interactive. I see there are some questions. I'm just gonna check. Um, Mateo says, so after an action is triggered, any binded value is refreshed just like a render function being called in React. Um, I think so, I don't know for sure, but I think that answer is true. Uh, but I will make a note of that and find out and I'll post the answer in the comments. Uh, I, I don't know if that's exactly the right answer, but I'll post the answer in the comments afterwards. Um, Aaron says, if you import the interactivity package into a block plugin, do you need to have the Gutenberg plugin installed for it to work? Essentially, yes. So if, you, if you're developing locally, and you import the, in, in the instructions, they talk about importing the package because you're developing locally. When it goes onto someone's site, they're going to need to have Gutenberg 17.2 installed on their site for your plugin to work because then the libraries that are installed will get installed that way. So that's why it's not really ready for building, building products for, for customers or for clients yet unless you get them to install Gutenberg in its current version until it gets merged into a core. Uh, so that is, that is the case there as far as I know. Uh, but I will I will check that one as well, Aaron, and just feedback if, if there's a different answer that I get from anybody in the team. Um, okay. 
So let's go through the API documentation again. So there's the interactive uh, directive. Then there is the context directive. So that provides a local state. So state being some form of data being stored and used and moved around. We saw that uh, earlier. We set up the is open value and we use that and it changed. Um, then there are other things. There's the bind one that we've seen. Uh, no, I don't think we saw bind, did we? Uh, no, we didn't see bind. So I wanted to show you bind quickly. Um, <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this list item out um, and I'm going to replace it with the current button and paragraph that I have here. And you'll notice that I'm not, not getting rid of my, my parent element. I'm keeping that there. I'm going to pop that list in there, which is using the bind. Um, actually, no, we, sorry, did we use the bind? We did, didn't we? Oh, we did, yes. We use it for the uh, the context is open and closed. So it's bound on that. And when, when is open changes, then the element changes. So we have used that already. So I apologize. Um, <clears throat> then there is class. So you can add or remove a class on an HTML element. We all remember has class and if is class or if has class, then add class. We remember those from the jQuery days. Uh, so you can do that kind of thing. Um, you can add or remove inline styles on an element using the WP style directive. And what I like about these examples, uh, this is very, very cool, is you've got the, the style directive element here. So I can copy out this, um, for example, the style, uh, and I'm gonna pop it inside of my, inside of my main, my main container here. And I'm going to just format it a bit better. I don't need the uh, log is open watch in the context anymore. So I'm just gonna remove the, those for this example. Uh, there's the context already there, color red. There's the on click actions toggle color. And then there's the style color, context color. So that's what's happening over there. Let's just format, format this a bit better. Um, what I like about the examples is they also, they use the, the sort of little opener item here and you can just grab the code um, and you can use it in your, in your example code. So if you start with the interactive template, then you can just kind of use this and, and, and have some fun with it. Um, so I'm gonna do that just now. I'm gonna pop this in here. Uh, the one thing I will need to change is the store needs to change to create block because that's the store I'm using. Um, I actually, I actually might um, try and update these examples because if you're working off the, off the scaffolded block, it'll be easier if it was all just create block. Um, so there you'll see it's calling the toggle content color, sorry, toggle context color action. It's getting the contents, then it's saying if it's red or if it's red, make it blue. If it's blue, make it red. Uh, so that's a few lines of code there. And then we've set up the click calling that action. And then there is the color style and there is that. So let's see if that works. Uh, my build should have finished. Yes, my build did finish. Uh, and let me find my, my interactive block here. Uh, so there we go. So let's toggle the color. Hey, it works. Um, so that's very cool. So those kind of very simple examples I like. It kind of shows you how things work and you can use it and you can dive into it. Um, and, and so all these directives are listed in the documentation. They've all got example code that you can have fun with. Uh, so there's the WP style, WP text, you can change text. Uh, there is a WP on, which runs code on dispatch DOM elements like click or key, key up, we've seen that. There's the watch, which we chatted about. So it runs a callback when the node is created and runs it again when the state or context changes. Um, so Mateus, this might be in relation to your answer as well. So whenever the state or the context changes, that watch callback will run and you can do things with it. Uh, it's useful for counters, increasing counters, decreasing counters. So all of them are listed with examples that you can use, that you can play with, with your scaffolded block and understand and see how they work. Okay. Um, so that's the last bit of documentation I wanted to share with you. Are there any other questions? If you do have questions and I can't answer them, I will find out the answers and share them in the meetup chat, in the meetup comments. So if you have any, any other questions now, please do let me know. Uh, I'm happy to admit that I don't know everything, but I'm also happy to go and find out answers. Um, while we do that, the last thing that I wanted to show you um, was, let me just go back here quickly. Yes, so I've shared all the reading with you. Um, one of the the, one of the cool examples in the block example, block development examples repository um, is right at the bottom here. It's this interactivity API countdown. Uh, you can download this and install it on your site. You will need Gutenberg 16.2 to have it up and running, uh, but you can then do something like this, which I thought was very, very cool. I created this on my personal blog yesterday. I just created a very little jolly Christmas countdown um, and it basically uses the interactivity API to have a countdown on my blog, uh, which is counting down the seconds till Christmas. Um, somebody asked me on Twitter when I shared this, like what, what time of day does your Christmas start? Uh, so I set this to uh, 
23.59 on the 24th. So just before midnight, I set it to. So that's what it's counting down to. And I'm in, in South Africa's time. So probably the time zones are a bit off. So probably for that person, it's showing at a different time. But this is a really cool example of the Interactivity API doing its thing. So on the back end of this, of this page, I'll actually show you the post. Um, I don't mind editing this post and showing you how it works. Um, in the edit component, you'll see that it's not interactive. It's just the time that you've set it to. And you can then click on the change date button and it simply just pops up a, a date time picker. So you'll see, oh, I set it for, for midnight. That's where I went wrong. I set it for midnight on the 24th. It should be midnight on the 25th. That's why it was wrong. Um, so they will fix it there quickly. Uh, so it's set for midnight on the 25th. Is that even right? No. No, it should be midnight on the 24th. It was right. But now will it be midnight at the start of the 24th or the start of the 25th? I can't remember. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that's not the point of this. Um, but then, so that just that's the edit component. It just handles showing that value and that and that um, that date picker. But then interactivity is handling all of this on the front end. So it's taking that value and it's making the countdown happen and it's changing all those values as the seconds count down. It's probably using some kind of live, you know, time or whatever. And I just thought it was a really cool little example of how the interactivity API can make things interactive on your WordPress site. Um, Okay, Crash says, Ami says, what will happen to interactive blocks if a website visitor has disabled JavaScript? Will they just do nothing or is there some sort of fallback? Again, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would assume it's like any other JavaScript related functionality. It will probably just end up not working. Uh, but again, I can find out if there's a fallback. Happy to find that out for you. Um, if, if folks disable JavaScript, then that's other things breaking as well. That might be you know, JavaScript enabled. I, I can't control that. I will check if there's a fallback and find out for that one. Um, Matei says, can I bind to events that are not related to DOM elements inside my block, like listen to root changes or scroll position? I don't know. Uh, I, I can find that out. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I think they're only bound to the elements in your block, but I'll find out for you on that one. And then Sega says, how do we to communicate between two interactive blocks? Um, I really don't know the answer to that. It's, it's so brand new. Um, so I can find that out for you as well. Happy to do so. Uh, if you want to ask these questions yourselves, which you are more than welcome to, um, the status update post that I shared earlier uh, has the, the discussions link. So right at the top um, of this, there is a, where can I, where can I ask questions? Um, so if you, if you, if you want to wait for me to find out the answers, I'm happy to do that. Uh, if you want to ask the questions yourselves, you can go there, you can go to the Interactivity API discussions. And please, I would encourage you to ask these questions. I haven't developed this software. I'm just the developer educator who's sharing it with you and showing you, you know, sort of the basics of how it works. I'm still diving into it myself. I waited until, because I knew that there was this, I don't like playing with things that are still experimental. Um, and the Interactivity API, I was was sort of marked as experimental up until 17.2 of Gutenberg. And so that's that's when I started playing with it, when it wasn't experimental anymore. Because I know as developers, when we say things are experimental, they're going to change. Code is going to change, how it works is going to change. And then it means I have to learn a new thing. Um, so I wait until it's not experimental anymore. I wait until sort of RC stage, beta RC stage. Um, Elliot, that's a good question. I don't know myself. Um, so uh, So that's why I've only started playing with it now. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about why I'm doing that after we've wrapped this up, because it also ties into my plans for the new year and my online workshops. So, so I don't have all the answers just yet. Um, uh, Mateus says, I'm supposing both our questions can be solved by registering events on the net lifecycle. Just was checking some of Again, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Uh, possibly, very possibly, but I don't know the answer to that. So I, I love the fact that you're asking these questions. I'm happy. I will go and find out the answers because it helps my knowledge increase. But if you would like to ask them yourselves, you can do them in those places. Um, so I will go and ask those questions. I, I have a log of this of the meeting chat so I can pull them out and ask them and I'll get some feedback for you and share it in the comments. Um, but uh, yes. All right. So that's my bit. That's all I wanted to share with you today. Um, if nothing else, I hope I've encouraged you to go and play with it and try it out and see what it can do. I want to thank uh, the folks who have asked the hard questions because it helps me to find out more about how this works. Um, if you're playing with this and you find these answers, please do share it with our community so we know how these things work. Um, but that ties quite nicely into... Uh, oh, it is. I love the idea of interactive API, but isn't this, this isn't a replacement for Ajax, right? Well, that's the thing. It depends on how you define a replacement for Ajax. Uh, if you mean just standard Ajax, um, possibly. 
Um, if you mean specifically WordPress and admin Ajax, possibly as well. Um, so my recommendation, if you're still using WordPress's Ajax implementation, using that admin Ajax uh, implementation, my recommendation would be to move away from doing that, um, to move more towards a REST API environment where you're making calls to the REST API and getting the data back that way. Um, if you mean Ajax in general, um, probably not. Probably standard Ajax will still work, but you probably won't use Ajax. You'll probably start wanting to use things like uh, the um, there's a there's a core there's a core data package that ships with the block editor, which you can use to re request data from your from your WordPress site. Um, if you need to request data from elsewhere, there's also something called the Axios package, which is a third party JavaScript package. I would recommend using that rather. Um, Ajax still sort of standard old school Ajax still has some some issues uh, in, in its security problem. So I would recommend switching over to using those things. Um, Sega says it's quite similar to Alpine JS. Yes, and you will notice that in the original proposal. Uh, and if you if you come from environments where you've used things like Alpine JS and all of that, in the comments um, there is a lot of discussion around other third-party libraries that exist and why the team who was working on this didn't use it. Um, so I'm glad, uh, Sega, that you mentioned Alpine JS. I'm just going to scroll down to the comments quickly. Um, but there was specifically a comment where somebody said why don't you use library X? I can't remember if it was Alpine or if it was something else. I just want to find it very quickly. Um, there, oh yeah, here we go. Kemery Grab says, are you familiar with HTML first interactivity libraries like HTMX, Alpine, or iPoly? And there's some discussion there about why they did or didn't use things. Um, there is also a discussion further down. Uh, Andrew Oz also mentioned Alpine JS. And then uh, Louis Harans responded as to why they chose different things over, over using AlpineJS. So I recommend reading that. Uh, so if you're used to some of those things, a lot of this probably looks very familiar. It's kind of WordPress's version of that. Um, I'm not involved in those decisions. So whether that was a good decision or a bad one is not one that I can comment on. My job is just to teach folks how these things work as much as I possibly can. Um, Matthias says, in a certain way, using the WordPress API own solution may be good for performance, future optimizations, just like using theme.js and custom CSS because it can handle better when things should just be loaded, et cetera. Yes, that's one very good example. Um, at the end of the day, it all depends on what your background is. Uh, my background is I use whatever's in front of me. Uh, so when I was working as a Laravel dev, I was doing Laravel things and whatever Laravel was doing. When I was working on other CMS systems, I was using whatever they use. Um, I don't have opinions. I, I once was in an interview where somebody said to me, what's your favorite ORM, your favorite, uh, what's it? Ob object relational mapper, which is a way to map data to your code. And I literally said to that person that day, whatever the framework is that I'm using uses. Uh, and that wasn't seen as a very, very clever answer, but that is my mentality. I'm not gonna have an argument about what is the best ORM or what is the best framework or what is the best whatever. Whatever I'm working on, that's what I'm going to learn to use and try and do the best that I can with that. Um, whether that's a good thing or not, we can have that discussion another day. Um, all right. Um, cool. So the last thing I want to mention before we wrap up here is that as we move into 2024, um, if you don't know, the training team has been working on something called the Learning Pathways Project. Um, and so there is the link there. Uh, if you want to read it, you're more than welcome to. Let me just hide this and share that. Um, and so my my role within the training team has changed slightly. Uh, I'm not going to be doing um, as structured and focused workshops as I have been doing in the past. I'm not going to have as much time to prepare my workshops. My workshops are going to be very similar to what I did today. So introduction to stuff, playing with things, questions that I don't have answers to that I'll find out later. Um, and they're also switching to more of a live stream format. So instead of using Zoom, I'm going to be using Twitch and live streaming on Twitch. Um, and that's because I'm literally going to be working on things, learning things, building things, and then presenting that content. Um, so so in the future, these, light, these, these workshops are going to be a little bit, hopefully a little bit more interactive because there'll be more questions that I don't know answers for because I haven't spent the whole you know, week studying it and learning it. Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to learn from you all as well as we go through this. Um, but in the future, they're going to be a lot less less structured, um, a lot more sort of, this is just what I'm working on, this is what I'm doing, um, and, and we'll sort of take it from there. The main topic that I'll be starting off with in the new year will be contributing to WordPress. Um, so I discovered recently that there is a big need for folks to be able to work on the WordPress REST API. 
Um, kind of everybody's focusing on the JavaScript side, Gutenberg, and how that works. Nobody's really working on the REST API, which powers uh, Gutenberg. So I'm going to be diving into re reminding myself of how that all works. I'm also going to be kind of using that time to review some of the current uh, local development environments that are available. Um, so in other words, um, looking at uh, WP Now, looking at WP ENV, uh, and kind of my, my opinions on those two. Um, and, and, and using those and, and sort of using one of those to start looking at contributing to WordPress and then going through from there. Um, Crash says, will someone else take your role at Learn WordPress of providing really well-structured explanation for developers? So I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving my job or leaving what I'm doing. The workshops that I'm working on just won't be as structured, but that's because the content that I'm working on will be more structured. So the Learning Pathways project that I'm working on, um, in the past, I used to just create these tutorials uh, about topics um, and kind of try and put them together in something that made sense. Now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be working on specific topics for the Learning Pathways project that are way more structured, way more goal orientated. Um, there is a beginner developer, uh, intermediate theme and plugin developer, and then advanced developer track for those learning pathways. And that's what I'll be focusing on. Um, so once that's all done, then that content will exist, which is more structured and explaining these things better. I'll have more time to dive into these new APIs like the interactivity API, how it works, what it does, uh, really understanding what it does. And that'll, that'll come into those learning pathways. So um, I'll still be around and you'll still be able to ping me with questions. And if there are specific topics you want me to discuss, we can certainly do that. But the workshops that I do every Thursday uh, will be more like today's session, a little bit more relaxed, uh, a little bit less research on my part. Um, hopefully more questions from your side that I can go find answers to and bring back the following week. Um, so hopefully it'll be something that you're keen to join every week because we'll have answers from the previous week coming over to the next week uh, and those kind of things. It'll be a little, a little bit more of a, a group environment, a group session that we do every week and learn with each other as opposed to being very, this is what you should do and this is how it works and da 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 da, da. So I hope that that's interesting and exciting to you. Um, Yes, the modules, were, yes. Um, Miriam says uh, more flush, fleshed out modules. Yes, the modules will be more fleshed out. Right now, if you have a look, I want to show you. Uh, if you have a look at learn.wordpress.org, for example, um, and you go to the homepage, there's these, there's these list of courses, and it's like community team program supporter and community team supporter basics. And then you go to tutorials, and it's like create block theme improvements and PHP compatibility. And then it's a navigation block. And then it's 6.4. And then it's the 2024 theme. And it's kind of all over the place. Whereas the goal is to have more of a structured environment where when you come to learn WordPress, you choose your path. You're either beginner developer, intermediate developer, advanced developer, beginner user, da, 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 da. And you go through that path step by step by step by step. And when you get to the end of that path, you know everything about that path. And then you can move on to the next path. Um, so the ultimate goal is more structured and more more detailed and more and more goal orientated. It takes a while to get there, though. It's going to take us probably at least the first half of next year to get there. Um, so if you are somebody who likes creating that kind of structured content, I invite you to join us in the training team. Uh, you can go over to the. I'm going to open up Slack and hope it's on the right channel. Uh, hopefully that's the WordPress one. Yes, it is. Uh, so if you're in the WordPress Slack, there is a training team channel. It's just hashtag training. Come and join us if you like creating structured learning content, specifically video video content or text content. We can work with that. Uh, and come and join us and help us make all this developer content. Um, if you want to see where we're starting in the project thread that I shared with you, there is, if you scroll down to the, I think it's in the comments. Uh, yes, there are some learning pathway outlines, content order. Here we go. Uh, there, the learning pathway outlines. Um, I can I can share that with you as well. Happy to do that. And you will share that. You will share that. You will see that we've got user, we've got designer, and we've got developer. And this is quite a lot of content that we're busy working on. Uh, there's plugin developer, theme developer, um, advanced debugging. So there's a lot of work we need to do to get this going. Uh, there's designer focused things. So if you're somebody who likes creating educational content around WordPress for designers, there's lots of stuff you can do there and for end users as well. So if you're interested in joining us with this project, please do consider joining in the training channel. Um, the Slack link, if you want to join the WordPress Slack, you can go to chat.wordpress.org. Um, that will require you to have a WordPress.org account. And then once you've got that account, you can join the Slack team. 
Uh, it's open to anybody who wants to join who has a WordPress.org account. So you can come and join us in training. Um, there's also one last thing I want to share with you. Uh, if you go to the training team handbook, I think it is, uh, there is something called the e guide program. Uh, and the guide program specifically is aimed at new contributors to the training team. So the way it works is you're new to the training team. You want to know where to get started. Um, the guide program will pair you up with a program guide who will meet with you <clears throat> three times over the course of, excuse me, <clears throat> three weeks and kind of step you through that progress. So if you're the kind of person who likes to have somebody along with you for the ride, I do recommend checking that out. There is a link of how you can participate in the program. If you're the kind of person that likes to just get in and get started on your own, we do have a getting started guide. So let me share that link as well. Um, and you can just get started from tomorrow. So it'll talk you through the, the process of getting started um, and you can and you can see where you wanna go. So I would like to invite anybody interested in creating any of this kind of content to join me next year in doing this. Uh, if you're somebody who likes doing videos or you like doing these kind of things, please feel free. Uh, if you like doing these kinds of online workshops and you want to help fill the gap of me not doing them as structured as I have been, you're welcome to do that as well. There's a process for doing that as well. Um, so do check that out um, and, and let me know if you have any questions. Oh, sorry, my voice is going there. All right. So this will be my last workshop for this year. Next week is my last week at work. And then I go on leave for two weeks, as I mentioned earlier. I want to thank everybody who's joined any one of these workshops this year, and especially those of you who have joined today and shared your questions, especially those who've asked me the hard ones that I need to go and research. I love finding out those answers. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you for joining me this year. It has been great to learn WordPress along with you. Uh, and I look forward to, to us learning more WordPress next year as we go. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for that comment. Elizabeth is from, from South Africa as well, so she knows exactly how nice the garden route is. Um, 2024, to me, I feel like is going to be a very exciting year for WordPress because there's lots of cool stuff happening built on top of the foundation of how far we've come with the block editor. Things like the interactivity API, things like the uh, collaborative editing, which is the next phase, things like multilingual, which is the phase after that. Uh, I think there is so many cool things happening. I'm very, very excited about it. So uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your year. Those of you who are celebrating Christmas, have a great Christmas and New Year. Um, and I will see you sometime in January for my first uh, live stream. Um, and I, I hope you all have, if you're taking some time off, I will have a, hope you all have a great break. Uh, and I'll see you in the New Year. Okay, bye-bye.